Thank you, Roberta. That reminds me of the little girl who said that butterflies are new and improved caterpillars. <laughs> How many of you this morning saw the moon? It's a full moon, round, like the picture that was on the wall earlier. Wasn't it absolutely amazing? And then as I was driving into the church, the sun was rising. And it was like, wow, isn't this a gorgeous earth? Isn't this a wonderful place to be? I think that we all have those moments in our lives when we feel so full of love and so full of the beauty of everything around us that we forget that there are sometimes dry places in our lives. And so this morning we're going to be talking about turning those dry lands in the arid places of our souls into wellsprings. When we are experiencing the dry lands in spirit, those places of our soul, it may seem that there is no wellspring left within us. And yet we know that there is because we have experienced it during those dry times when we were able to connect with that wellspring and bring forth all of that cool, wonderful water. King David addressed this idea of God's ability to transform these dry periods in Psalms 107.35. It says, He turns the, wil the wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. In this passage is the assurance that we will find that which we seek. And I believe that that is true. If we truly are seeking for something, we are going to find it. And it comes not so much from our own efforts, but from the grace of our Creator. There is a beautiful poem that I really love about, it's, it's entitled The Fountain. And it talks about these wellsprings that we have. And I'd like to read it to you this morning. It's by Denise uh, Lavertov. Don't say, don't say there is no water to solace the dryness of our hearts. I have seen the fountain springing out of the rock wall and you drinking there. And I too, before your eyes, found footholds and climbed to drink the cool water. The woman of that place, shading her eyes, frowned as she watched, but not because she grudged the water, only because she was waiting to see we drank our fill and were refreshed. Don't say, don't say there is no water. That fountain is there among its scalloped green and gray stones. It is still there and always there with its quiet song and strange power to spring in us. I'd like to tell you about a place that I used to go when I was a little girl. It was a beautiful place. It was a pristine place, and it was located between Joplin and, ne and Neosho, Missouri. Now, how many of you know where that is? <laughs> you know where it is. Oh, my goodness. Somebody actually raised their hand, John. Um, it was on a little, little side road, not the main road that went between the two towns, but it was on a side road, and my parents had grown up in that area, and so they knew of this place. And every year we would go, and I was just, I don't know how old I was, because we went several, several years, and, and it, was, it was just such a beautiful place. And my parents went to, pop, to pick watercress there, and I remember going, and, and I was always thrilled when we went, because there was a bluff, and... Below the bluff, there was a spring that came out of the ground and flowed towards the, the road, actually. 
and went under the road. But this stream was just really a beautiful little place. The water was sparkling, pure and clean. It was an amazing place for a little child to be because the water turned the stones into jewels. And, and all of the sparkling things around and the green next to the, next to the little stream and the moss on the rocks, it was, was just a magical place. And in that little stream, there were, there were tadpoles. And have, how many of you have ever caught tadpoles? <laughs> oh, quite a few of you, quite a few. Well, you know it's not easy, is it? Because they're slippery, slippery little rascals. And they, they slide right out of your hand, but I caught a few. And I have no idea what happened to them after I caught them. And I don't think I want to go there. So um, it, was, it was a magical experience for me. And that water coming out of the earth was like a miracle. It was like a miracle, and it was so pure you could drink it. So even though in our desert experiences, the wellsprings of life are within us, in that desert experience, the divinity within us is working with us to produce a resilient spirit. Resilient spirit is something that we are all looking to bring forth in our lives. Such a resilient spirit was Hetty Hillison. Hetty was Jewish, and she lived in Amsterdam, Holland, in World War II. And she was 27 years old, and she began to write a journal. Now, within the pages, she reveals an inner and astonishing depth. She was a woman of intense passions, discerning intellect, and a capacity to feel deeply, which sometimes threatened to overwhelm her. In her journal, Eddie recorded that Mornings were difficult, and she felt a series, she felt a sense of drowning despair. And yet, later in the day, she felt that she felt a pouring out of feelings of radiance and of peace. Hetty Hillism had a very strong drive to find meaning and purpose in life. She, she really had a very strong drive to know herself better. And this drive grew even stronger as the terror of the Holocaust grew nearer. Sensing that she needed some discipline to help her tolerate these turbulent feelings, Hetty decided that she would begin meditating every day for half an hour to listen. Her intention, as she puts it, was to turn her innermost being into a vast, empty plane. Eddie observed that she was often writing about the pains in her body. And with radical honesty, honesty, she confronted herself and she said, Don't delude yourself, Eddie. It is not really your body. It is your ravaged little soul that afflicts you. And then she says, she writes, I still lack a basic tune, a steady undercurrent of the inner source that feeds me. She watched her world shrink as the yellow stars were issued and the streets and the shops were closed to Jews and friends received orders to report to the work camps. As her world constricted, her devotional life and her faith grew stronger. So too did her ability to accept everything that happened to her. This isn't to say that her demons disappeared. But even in her moments of despair, she insisted that life is meaningful. There is a room for everything in a single life for belief in God, and for a miserable end. What I feel, she said, is not hopelessness, far from it. I have lived life a thousand times over. 
and I have died a thousand times. Am I blasé then? No. She says, it is a question of living life from minute to minute. Living life from minute to minute and taking suffering into the bargain. Eddie Hillison looked deeply at her life and she accepted it as it happened. Her journals and letters from the Wester Bork work camp are inspiring testimony to the power and the strength she developed through her devotions. One observ observation is extremely noteworthy. The sky is full of birds, she wrote. The flowers stand up so regally and peacefully. Two little old ladies sit on a box having a chat. The sun is shining on my face. And right before our eyes, mass murder. Hillisum died on November 30th. In 1943 at Auschwitz. In the end, she wrote, the departure came without warning. We left the camp singing. Eddie's writings show us how to grow a soul that is brilliant as well as resilient. It, bring, it begins when we practice showing up in our lives for all it brings. The wellspring is found in daily spiritual practice, sustained by communion with the source of life itself. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus set a precedent for spiritual transformation. Each of them observed a 40-day period of prayer and fasting in preparation for spiritual work. Georgiana Tree West, one of Unity's authors, writes, Moses received the Ten Commandments after, his, after the conclusion of his prayer and fasting. Elijah talked with God on Mount Horeb at the, at the conclusion of his practice of prayer and fasting. And Jesus began his great spiritual ministry at the close of his fast in the wilderness. The truth is that the desert experience is necessary. And if we understand that one fact, we can rejoice when we're in a dry land. The reason is that great new birth arises from the experience and marvelous spiritual advancement that follows an experience such as this, if we allow it to. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells parables, and he tells a string of parables at this time. And um, he tells the parable of the sower that went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell upon the path, and the birds swooped down and devoured them. And other seeds fell on, on rocky ground where they could... They did not have much soil, and they immediately sprang up. But since they had no depth, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. The other seeds <clears throat> fell upon good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. And he concludes this parable with, he who has ears, let him hear. Metaphysical interpretation is one that Jesus gives himself because many of the, the disciples did not understand what some of these meant. And so Jesus starts to tell them what it meant. The sower, he doesn't say this part, but uh, we'll get to that later. 
The sower is the indwelling Christ, which is always speaking the word of truth to each one of us. And there are four types of hearers that hear this parable. Each hearer represents degrees of spiritual understanding. And Jesus mentions this when he uses the parable of the sower to describe this phenomenon. Spiritual trans the first hears the word, but is so lacking in spiritual understanding that the ego, represented by the bird, snatches away what is sown in his heart by eating up the seeds. Spiritual transformation is not a process. It is a process and usually doesn't happen instantaneously. Sometimes people get tired of the work and the, and and. It, they, they drop by the wayside because it just becomes something that they just don't want to put the energy into. The second hears the word and receives it gladly and remembers that it is remembers it for a time. However, this person is only has superficial knowledge and when the trials come, thrust the word aside. Here is the person. Here, the person's mind is like the rocky, hard soil and shallow, and yet he has no root in himself, but endures only until something comes along like tri tribulation or, or persecution on the account of his beliefs, and immediately he falls away. So the sprouting seed cannot take root, and it dies in the scorching trial, which Jesus depicts as the scorching sun. The third hears the word, and this person's mind is like thorny ground. He or she is obsessed with a sense of the world and the burdens and the cares of the world and is absorbed in the pursuit of wealth and finds delight in riches. These are the thorns that choke the seed and keep it from growing. But just remember, it is the obsession that is the problem, not the riches. The fourth here is the result, <laughs> the fourth here as a result of the, of the um, study of spiritual things, dedication and love for God, has a receptive mind. The receptive and the receptively, um, the receptivity found found a, a stronghold in the earth, and the, the roots go deep, deep into the wellspring of life, and there it produces fruit, sometimes a hundredfold, sometimes 60, sometimes 30. Thich Nhat Hanh, in his commentary on the sutra, puts a little, it a little differently. He says, if we cling to the idea of hope in the future, we might not notice the peace and joy that are available in the present moment. The best way to take care of the future is to take care of the present moment. You know, this makes a lot of sense to me. And I, if I give in to my anxiety, what I am going to see in the, about the future, what I will walk into is anxiety. If I surrender my anxiety and open my heart to, to the fullness and the wonder of life in the present moment, I will walk into fullness and wonder. Eddie Hillison calls it having the courage to feel empty and discouraged and it is followed by having the courage to release. I do not cling to such moments of agony, she writes. They pass through me like life itself as a broad, eternal stream. Become part of that stream, and life continues. No, this is not an invitation to rise above our problems but rather to let them in and to encounter them with as much gentleness as we can find. The resilient spirit is always in the present, neither looking forward nor backward. 
It looks to the now, to the new revelations and realizations of this day. Joy wells up from within as it realizes that there are beautiful songs to be sung and new adventures ahead. And that we are, what we are doing now is not to be missed. What we are doing in this moment is not to be missed. And this is going from dry lands to wellsprings. God bless you. And thank you.